Hello everyone. Uh, before we get started, I just want to kind of let you know if you uh, enjoy one of these messages and want to share it with your friends or share it on your Facebook page, just click on the little three dots that are right there below the video. Scroll down where it says share um, and you have the option of either directly sharing it or you can copy the link and paste it uh, wherever you want to paste it. So anyway, feel free uh, to share these videos with your friends and family and put it on your Facebook page or whatever you want to do with them. Uh, so anyway, let's get started. Uh, today I want to talk about Pentecost. Um, I realize and understand that, the, that as I'm shooting this video, uh, this is not the uh, calendar day of Pentecost. Um, but the reason I'm going ahead, going ahead and doing this is there really isn't a whole lot of um, preaching content between Jesus' resurrection and the day of Pentecost. And I would rather just go ahead and do the day of Pentecost and then move on to uh, some other sermons that, I'll, that I've have planned and ready to do. Uh, so anyway, so today we're going to talk about the day of Pentecost. Um, we're about a month early uh, doing this, but, uh, but I think we'll be okay. Um, and so let's look at Acts chapter 2. Uh, we're going to look at verses 1 through 16. It says, when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire, distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Now there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the crowd came together and were bewildered because each one of them was hearing them speak in his own language. They were amazed and astonished, saying, Why are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we each hear them in our own language to which we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the districts of Libya around Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans, and Arabs, we hear them in our own tongues speaking of the mighty deeds of God. And they all continued in amazement and great perplexity saying to one another, What does this mean? But others were mocking and saying, They are full of sweet wine. But Peter, taking his stand with the eleven, raised his voice and declared to them, Men of Judah and all you who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give heed to my words. For these men are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken of through the prophet Joel. And if you read on, you'll see the prophecy um, that, that Joel spoke. Um, but let's pray. Father God, I thank you for this day. I, I thank you for allowing us to, to hear your word um, through untraditional means. And God, I ask you to just bless this time. Speak through me the words uh, that you want them to hear, dear God. And, and God, just empty me out. Make me an empty vessel so that you can fill me up with your words and with your spirit. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So, let's break this down. First, I'm going to look at uh, verses 1 through 4. And, and there's some really interesting stuff in verses 1 through 4 uh, that I, I find some parallel uh, back to the Old Testament. And, and we'll, we'll see what I'm talking about here in just a second. But it says, when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as a fire distributing themselves. And they rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. The day of Pentecost... It's actually the Jewish festival of Shavuot, and it celebrates the giving of the Torah and the beginning of the summer harvest. So you have, they're, they're, they're there celebrating or preparing to celebrate uh, the feast or the festival where they celebrate the giving of the Torah. That's the giving of the law. Um, 
That's the giving of the commandments. And also the harvest. Now, notice the 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 irony or kind of the, the significance here. They're celebrating the giving of the law and they're celebrating the harvest. And what did Jesus talk about through his whole ministry? He talked about he came to fulfill the law, but then he also constantly, constantly talked about how the fields are ripe with harvest. So you have a day when they're celebrating the law and they're celebrating the harvest and they're about to receive the Holy Spirit that's going to allow them to share the message of the man who fulfilled the law and told them about the harvest. So, and the disciples were waiting about a week from the time Jesus ascended into heaven until now is about a week. Um, and so they wait about a week and they waited patiently for God to show them what to do next. Um, now for some of us, that doesn't seem like a long period of time because I, I feel like I've, there's been times that I've waited months and years for God to show me what he wants out of my life. And so it's, um, you know, but it's interesting the disciples, they, they did. They waited a week. And I, I find it no coincidence that their waiting a week allowed this event to happen on the day, as I said, when they're celebrating the law and they're celebrating the harvest. Um, tongues of fire. You know, it, say, it says that tongues of fire came upon them. Does, it, does this remind you of anything? Uh, think back Old Testament. Think back to Isaiah. Isaiah was in the temple. And he's standing before the cherubim and the seraphim. And he's he's recognizing and he, and he makes the confession. He says, Lord, I am a man of unclean lips. And what happens? The cherubim grabs a, a, a piece of a piece of flaming coal from the altar and places it on Isaiah's lips to purify them, to cleanse them. Here you have tongues of flames, tongues of fire, landing on the lips and on the tongues of the disciples. The reason why it's tongues of fire and tongues of flame and not anything else was it had to be a purifying event remember the disciples all ran and fled yeah they spent 40 days with Jesus after his after his uh, resurrection and they were restored um, and I have to imagine we, we read about Peter's restoration but I would have to imagine that Jesus probably had a, a sit down conversation with each disciple and, and restored them to their rightful place but they still had to have that purifying on their lips and on their tongues. And they still had to have that, uh, that boldness and that flame added to them. Because what these tongues and lips were about to profess was going to cost all of them a lot of pain and suffering. And for, for all but one of them, it was going to cost them to be um, executed. And so they had to have that purifying fire uh, upon them. It's also important to note when you read the, the passage in Isaiah that it's after the, the, the flaming coal was placed on his lips that God commissioned him. This is the part where God says, I need someone to go speak for me. Whom shall I send? And Isaiah says, here I am, Lord, send me. Well, it's after the tongue, the flaming tongues land on the disciples that they then begin to share and spread the message of the gospel. So there's a, there's a lot of good parallel here between what happened with Isaiah and what happened with the disciples. 
of that, that flaming tongue, the flaming fire on the lips and on the tongues to purify and to cleanse. And then you have the commissioning, the sending out. Now you can go and share the gospel. Now let's look at verses 5 through 12. It says, Now there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the crowd came together and were bewildered because each one of them was hearing them speak in his own language. They were amazed and astonished, saying, Why are not all these who were speaking Galileans? And how is it that we each hear them in our own language to which we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the districts of Libya around Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them in our own tongues speaking of the mighty deeds of God. And they all continued in, amazed, in amazement and great perplexity, saying to one another, What does this mean? What does this mean? What does it mean that spontaneously as the disciples spoke, everybody around them was hearing their own language? Well, I want to take you back a little bit. Not far, but just a little bit. I want to take you back to John's account of the crucifixion. In John's account of Jesus' crucifixion, he mentions that Jesus' charges were written both in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Now, those were the three dominant languages of that time. Almost everyone, and probably everyone during that time, either spoke or could understand Hebrew, Latin, or Greek. Um, today, the two dominant languages are English and French. And so most of everything you see um, in, in Spanish, I'd say probably English, English, French, and Spanish. And, and just about everything you see is written, um, if there are only three languages, they're written in English, lang in English, French, and Spanish. In America, most everything is written in English and Spanish. And the reason for that is, is we want everybody possible um, to understand and comprehend what's being said. So when Pilate wrote Jesus' charges, he wrote them in three different languages. And what he was doing was is he was making sure that everyone who could possibly walk by that cross could see in their own language and understand in their own language why he was on the cross. And so now you have, at Pentecost, you have a major influx of people, an even bigger influx of people from various nations who speak many different languages they likely could understand one of the three languages. You know, most of them could probably understand or comprehend or at least know what's being said in, in essence in Greek, Latin, or Hebrew. But to fully get the depth of what is being told to them to the point of being able to make a conversion of faith, they needed it more in their specific language. Um... And I would kind of attribute it to, we speak English here, those in Great Britain speak English as well. However, some of the words are different. Um, we have different different words for certain things. Um, in, in, in this, particularly in the South, a biscuit is a biscuit. Well, in England, a biscuit is something totally different. And so you have at, at the crucifixion, you have three languages because everybody basically understood those three languages and they can look and see what was going on. Um, they, they're getting the visual as well as the written. At Pentecost, they're only getting the verbal. And so in, in them only getting the verbal, God appointed the disciples to be able to speak in all the different languages that they were going to encounter. And so that's that's the important thing to note there. Um, and, and the thing I want you to understand out of this, and this is both with the crucifixion and the three languages on the, on the cross, and at Pentecost with the multiple languages uh, being spoken there, is it is a prime example of the love of God. 
God loves you enough to speak your language. He will present his message to you in a way that you'll understand it. That's what God is intending at Pentecost. That's what God intended on, at the three languages on the cross. He wanted to make sure that anyone who encountered his message would comprehend it, would be able to understand it, that there would be no doubt what that message meant. That's the love of God, that he will first speak your language and give you your message, give you his message in your language, in the way you understand it. Let's move on. Uh, let's look at 13 through 16. It says, But others were mocking and saying, They are full of sweet wine. But Peter, taking his stand with the eleven, raised his voice and declared to them, Men of Judea and all you who lived in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give heed to my words. For these men are not drunk as you suppose, for it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken of through the prophet Joel. Now, I want you to understand first when it says they're full of sweet wine, what they are talking about here most likely, and this is not my uh, full ex expert on this, but most likely it is, it is what they call a honey mead. Uh, it was the sweetest um, beverage that they had. And it was a very common uh, uh, drink uh, among that time where it was basically a, a, uh, a wine fermented from honey. And, uh, but anyway, um, and it was typically a non-ceremonial. And that's kind of why they were saying sweet wine, uh, why you see the, the actual word sweet in there, sweet wine is what they're saying here is is what they're doing is the reason they're talking like this is not because they've been partaking of um, ceremonial wine festival uh, wine and appropriate wine it's because they're doing the sweet wine they're taking the the tasty party wine and that's that's the distinction here is they're being accused of throwing a party and it's not so much and, and it's not just that they're being accused of being drunk is that they're being accused of throwing a party at a time when they're supposed to be, uh, and it is a festival and it is a feast, but it's, but it's also a time of, of seriousness. And so they're being accused of throwing a party, in, in essence, during a time of seriousness. It's the, the, the receiving of the law and the preparation of the harvest. And so this is the accusation here is, is you know, we're supposed to be preparing for the harvest. We're supposed to be... Um, celebrating and, and, and taking serious the, the law, these men are getting drunk off of party wine. But I want you to gather from this, there will always be spirit quelters. There will always be those people who will want to quench the spirit. They want to quench other people's spirit. And you have to be careful of them. They will begin to prevent you from worshiping God your way. They might not accuse you of being drunk, but they'll say other discouraging things. And here's some of the things you might hear from what I call spirit quenchers. You look silly. Do you know how silly you look doing that? You can't live a sinful life during the week and still worship God on Sunday. Now, I hear that a lot. And the, the interesting thing about that is no, you can't live two lives. I, I, will, I will somewhat agree to that, that you cannot live two lives. You can't worship God and be sinful um, and, and live in sin at the same time. But let me, let me put a connotation on this. When you enter a time of worship, you're often entering a time of repentance. And whether you've lived a sinful life throughout the week or not, God will still allow you to worship him. God will still allow that repentance to take place. And when that repentance takes place and that forgiveness takes place, yeah, you better be worshiping uh, because that's your response to God providing you with, with repentance and forgiveness. Now, what I would caveat with that is if you go back to living your sinful life the next week, then is when I have to question whether or not the repentance actually took place. Um, and so really I would actually reverse that statement and say, 
you can't repent on Sunday and go back to living your your sinful life the next week because that tells me that the repentance didn't re didn't really uh, be effectful or be effective. So, kind of you know, when you see people worshiping and you kind of have that thought in your mind was, well, I just saw them doing such and such the other day. Well, they may be worshiping because they got repentance for what they did the other day. So let's celebrate the, their time of worship and, and and allow them their time of worship. Now, what you might want to do is if you see them going back to that sin the next week, that's when you might want to, you know, reach out to them and say, you know, hey, you 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 were worshiping God Sunday. Let's not ruin it today. And so, and another thing you might hear is, is we don't act like that here. You ever hear that one? Ever say that to somebody? Somebody raising their hand, clapping, maybe dancing a little bit, jumping up and down. We don't act like that here. Well, when you read back in the Old Testament, David got pretty crazy with his worship. So when you, when you see those people who might be getting a little bit too excited and you want to quench their spirit, you might just want to be thankful for leaving their clothes on because David got a little bit crazy with his, with his worship. And I'm sure you've heard others. But don't let those people stop you from worshiping in the way that God called you to worship. You know, I'm always reminded um, whenever I hear conversations about someone else doing this and someone else doing that, I'm always reminded of Paul when Paul said, work out or seek out your own salvation with fear and trembling. What Paul was essentially saying there is, is it's your relationship with God. It's not our relationship with God. It's your relationship with God. I have a different relationship with God than you do. And you should have a different relationship with God than I do. Because if we didn't, if we all had the same relationship with God, it wouldn't be personal. And I want my relationship with God to be personal. So don't worry about if somebody else is worshiping God in a different way than you are. Because they're worshiping God in a way that fits their relationship with God. Not your relationship with God. And always understand that when Jesus warned us about persecutions... He wasn't just warning us about persecutions from the outside world. He was warning us about persecutions from inside the church. And understand that Jesus, and really the disciples too, faced their biggest challenges and their biggest persecutions, not from the outside world, but from the religious leaders. And so... These accusations, and that's the thing, these accusations of them being drunk on wine actually comes from Jewish people, from, their, from people who were there to worship, from people who were there to celebrate the feast. Don't be afraid to get drunk in the Holy Spirit. But I will say this. When you do... When you do get excited about the Holy Spirit, when you do get, quote-unquote, junk in the Holy Spirit, when you do get into your, your worshiping mode, make sure that you're speaking a language that others understand and in a way that will lead them toward Christ. It's good to get excited. It's good to worship God in your own way. My only challenge is, is when you're in public and you're worshiping God and you're serving God and you're doing things for God and you're getting excited about God, that you do it in such a way that, uh, that reaches people, that speaks to them in their language, that brings them to the cross, that brings them to a relationship with Christ. Because that's what it's all about. Our worship is to draw us close enough to God and close enough to Him that we can then reach out and we can then have the Holy Spirit fill us up 
to the point of overflowing so that we have an impact on those around us and we can lead them to a relationship with Christ. Let's pray. Father God, again, I come to you and I thank you for, for all that you do for us. I thank you for this message. I thank you for the fact that you love us so much that you want to make sure that we receive your message in our language. That we, that we receive your message in a way that fits our personality. That our relationship with you is a personal relationship. God, it amazes me that the billions of people on this planet, you love each one of us in our own special way. You find our love language and you meet us at our love language. And you develop a personal, intimate relationship with each and every one of us. God, I pray that you would, you would cleanse us, purify our lips and our tongues with the fire of the Holy Spirit so that we can then turn around and reach the world around us through that Holy Spirit, with that Holy Spirit. And we would do it in a way that we reach people speaking their language and reaching them in their personalities. God, I ask that you would go with us, guide us, direct us, and most importantly, God, speak and live through us so that we can bring others to you. In Jesus' name, amen.